tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to episode 22 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. As the wife and I were putting together this week's episode, I was titillated, ooh, uh, never mind, when I realized both stories take place on the ocean. Pirates are mentioned as well as booty. The money kind, ya nasty heathens. It of course reminded me of a joke that I will now share, me matey heartlanders. A pirate walks into a bar with a steering wheel tied around his waist. The bartender looks at the pirate and asks, why do you have a steering wheel tied around your waist? The pirate answers, arr, it drives me nuts. Two tales tonight, and as I mentioned, they both take place on the ocean and involve captains of vessels with some mighty decisions to make. The first is by newcomer to Fear from the Heartland, Kisto Healy, and a good friend of the show, Heath Path, brings us story number two. Let's get after it. Darren was new to these cargo trips, but he trusted his captain. Clark had been out here a hundred times and knew what he was doing. Clark told Darren to ignore the mermaids. He said they were dangerous and not to play into their game. All that mattered was delivering what was in the cargo hold. As the days went by and the mermaids relentlessly followed the ship, Darren started to feel uneasy. He started to worry that maybe Clark was wrong. He found it harder and harder to ignore the people beneath the surface of the water. And just like that, the game was afoot. And now for your indulgence, The Mermaid's Game by Kisto Healy. Darren stood at the bow of the boat, staring at the beautiful topless woman that floated and bobbed in the water nearby, her fire red hair fanning out into the sea around her. She was smiling at him. It was the most gorgeous smile he had ever seen. Big, with full lips a shade of blue-green as opposed to the red or maroon he was used to seeing. What was she doing out here in the middle of the ocean? There was nothing out here. He hadn't even seen any other boats. Not for days. Well, whoever she was, she was wonderful. He knew that much. His eyes soaked up the curves and contours of her face and followed them down to her perfectly tanned arms and the large, swollen breasts that floated out before them. Darren would have loved for her to come on board, and he considered inviting her to do just that. He closed his eyes for a second and fantasized about making love to her in his cabin. Those luscious green lips entwined with his own dried-out sun-bleached lips, her tanned body atop his sunburned one. The seemingly endless voyage finally felt worthwhile. The countless days went by no longer mattered and tugged at his sanity. His body twitched. He could almost feel her slender hands upon his flesh. He needed to see her again. 
yet when he opened his eyes, she was gone. Nothing was before him but the vast expanse of the never-ending dark blue ocean that had been suffocating him for months. She had seemed so real. Darren blinked and stared at the water. He squinted and strained, but the woman was gone. If she was real and not just a hallucination from too many days in the sun, she had somehow disappeared when he wasn't looking. He shook his head. He had been out on the water too long. He had known that already, but now he was starting to see things, to imagine things, or allow his brain to trick his eyes. After a while, when you've been out here long enough, everything starts to look like a beautiful woman. He imagined himself humping a rock face, and he chuckled cynically. You're not going crazy, Clark said, walking over to him. He patted Darren's back and then looked over the railing at the empty water. But if you see her again, you do best to act like you didn't anyway. Trust me on that. We don't have that much longer until this is all over, and we don't need the kind of trouble she could bring. Darren shook his head and blinked more. He glanced at the ship's captain. His confusion was evident. If I'm not going crazy, then where the hell did she go? You may be able to not look at a beautiful woman's naked breasts, but I don't have that skill, Clark. Especially after seeing no one but you for so long. No offense. Develop that skill, Clark said. She's not human and she's not alone. I brought you along on this trip to help me, but I've been doing this a long time. I know what's out there. You're going to have to trust me. If you see her again, act like you don't. Darren raised an eyebrow and looked at him quizzically. I've been out here with you way too long for you to get all cryptic on me now. Speak plainly, Clark. Do you think there are a lot of naked women floating around in the middle of the ocean? She's one of the mirror. Is that plain enough? There was an intensity in Clark's sun-dried gaze. His bronze skin seemed ready to crack as if the fire in his eyes was too much for his face to handle. A mermaid, Darren said, looking back out at the water. Even though the concept was half crazy, somehow he knew it was true. Clark had never given him a reason to distrust him, but it wasn't even that. It was something deeper, something instinctual. Like the answer just made sense out of his experience somehow. I didn't know mermaids were real. Are they dangerous? They're extremely dangerous, Clark told him. But it's not the female you need to worry about. It's her mate. And if you see her, he's nearby. Eyes still on the water, Darren said, There are mermaid men? Clark sighed. The mer have men and women and unions, just like us. The men are very possessive and jealous, though. They will kill anyone that touches their women or even tries to. You keep looking at her and he'll perceive you as a threat. Not much different than humans, Darren said with a laugh, finally pulling his eyes away from the water. You're right about that, just like us. It's not a joke, though, Clark said. They're volatile and plenty capable. What's worse is the women enjoy it. They flirt with sailors, just to anger their mates and see the violence that they are willing to commit in the name of love. It turns them on. It's all a game to them and not one that I want to play. The stakes are too high. Get me? You sound like you know from experience, Darren said. You faced them before? What happened? What do you think happened? Do you hear what I'm telling you? I've lost many crew members to Demir. Please don't add to that list, Darren. Just do what I'm telling you. Don't look and don't engage. Darren nodded. How come they've never gotten you? How did you get away? I didn't do anything badass if that's what you're thinking. I don't so much as look at them. They might as well be coral to me. It's the only way. Even after they've gutted one of your guys and dragged him into the depths. The sea is a dangerous place, Darren. There are many dangers. You must know them all and not give in to them ever. You don't play their game. Right, Darren said, turning his eyes back to the water. I can't believe you had to pretend not to see them after they killed your crew. That couldn't have been easy. Easier than joining them. 
Darren pulled his eyes off of the water, feeling suddenly wary of what he might spy out there. Icy fingers crawled up his spine even in the heat of the sun that was baking them to a crisp. He forced a smile and worked to change the subject. Hey, Clark, what's in the cargo we picked up? Why did we do all this? Is it worth it? Clark shrugged his shoulders. I don't know, man. I learned a long time ago not to ask questions. I just do my job. It's still better than pirating, right? I mean, at least I'm getting something I'm intended to and not stealing. Sure, the cargo could be hot, but that's not on me. I'm just a courier. So a blind eye is your specialty, huh? It better be yours, too. Don't make me regret choosing you for this job, Darren. Of course not, Darren said. He watched Clark walk away, and then his eyes moved back to the water. He was searching the surface for shadows underneath. Was she gone? How many were there? His mind took the bait and showed him images of a school of half-human fish lurking under and around their ship, waiting on their moment to strike. He shook off the vision and backed away from the edge. He couldn't seem to get far enough back to feel safe. The waters were pretty calm, but his nerves weren't. He decided to go lay down. For the first time since he had been out here, he was beginning to feel seasick. The following day, Darren saw the woman again, floating, her full naked breasts bouncing on the water's surface like buoys. She looked his way with that enticing smile and batted her big green eyes at him when he looked back at her. Darren looked around for his captain, but he wasn't nearby. He sighed and looked back at the beauty. It was hard to think of something so sensual as dangerous. His eyes left her then and searched the waters nearby for signs of another. He had been told it was the mate he had to fear. He didn't see anyone but the red-headed beauty smiling his way, but that didn't mean that no one else was there. He hadn't forgotten how easily she fell out of sight when she wanted to. Clark says you're a married woman, he said to her. That's bad news. It was hard to pull his eyes away from those caramel-colored breasts with their sun-browned nipples and her thick, full lips of green that matched her magnificent eyes. But Darren thought he did see a man's head just above the surface of the water, back behind her. Was this the game? Was the male waiting to see if he was going to play? Darren imagined Clark's men being torn and eviscerated by a snarling merman full of razor-sharp teeth, and it was enough to make his decision. He wasn't willing to take that chance. He wasn't going to play anyone's games. I don't mess with another guy's girl, he said to her. Sorry, lady, I'm not interested. Darren turned and walked away. The only way he could get himself not to stare at something that looked that good when he had been on the water so long was not to be where he could see it. The temptation was more than he was capable of resisting. He thought even Clark was going to start looking good if they didn't get home pretty soon, and he definitely didn't swing that way. A drunk night with a close friend had proved that to him long ago. Even after she was out of sight, her image still bounced around behind his eyes. There was no denying her beauty. It was hard to get her out of his head. Clark said she was dangerous, though, and Darren believed him. No one knew the sea like Clark did. Darren tried to focus on the myrrh that he couldn't see, but could see him. Suddenly, he didn't like having his back to the water. He felt vulnerable, unguarded afraid. He swung around and found his red-headed temptress was gone, the water bobbing along, swaying back and forth to its natural rhythm. Games, he thought. Clark's right. It's all games. The hair stood up on his arms and he wished this trip were over. He felt an overwhelming need to get home and be done with this. The pay was good, but he had had enough of the sea for a while. He longed for his small apartment loft, far from any sign of water outside of the small sink and the shower stall. He felt eyes on him, even though he seemed to be alone, and it didn't sit well with him. He felt uncomfortable with whatever was happening out here. His skin crawled like it was alive and wanting to leave without him. Someone was behind him. He could feel it. He spun around and found Clark there. The captain of the ship extended his arm. He was holding a pot. Thought y'all might be hungry. Y'all right? You didn't see her again, did you? No. Darren lied to avoid the lecture. I'm just not feeling well. Maybe it's because I'm hungry. In which case, thank you for saving me. Clark shook his head and laughed, turning around. 
Darren followed him to the tables on the lower deck, but not without pausing at the top of the stairs and looking out at the water. He thought he saw a man in the distance, just his face, breaking the surface of the water and staring in his direction with hard green eyes. But he blinked, and it was gone. He hoped to God it was his imagination. Whatever it was, it was enough to get him to hurry down those stairs. Two days later, Darren thought he saw the woman bobbing along behind the boat. He took Clark's advice and didn't so much as look at her. How was she still there with how long they had been sailing? He thought it was because they were passing through the MERS territory, but now it seemed like the sea people had come with them. He went to find Clark. I think that mermaid followed us, he said when he did. Clark met his eyes and nodded. Of course they did. This is all part of the game. They'll follow us across the entire ocean if they're bored enough. Just pay them no mind, and eventually they'll find someone more interesting and break away. Then they'll be someone else's problem. You think they ever get snared in fishing nets? Darren asked. If they did, we wouldn't know, Clark told him, because everyone on that boat would be killed and they would be cut loose. He turned and walked away on that note, and a chill danced its way over Darren's spine. The next day, Darren was staring at the stars. It was a literal light in the dark. He needed it. He was homesick and over it. But Clark said it would only be a few more days before they made it back. He wished a woman was waiting for him back home. She didn't have to look like the woman in the water. It just would have been nice to know that someone was at home waiting on him, anxious for him to get back. He had never married, though. It wasn't for lack of trying. It just seemed like it wasn't in the cards for him. His apartment was empty. There was no one waiting, no one that would even know if he never made it home. Darren noticed the mermaid then, smiling at him from the water beside the boat. It was like she could read his thoughts or feelings. She knew when he was vulnerable. She showed herself when he needed to see her. She was feeding off of his loneliness, and that pissed him off. He knew it was a manipulation, part of the game, and why it worked. It made him so angry. How dare she? It was just cruel, and to do it with her husband waiting in the wings, hungry for blood. It was just so messed up. He looked at her and she gave him a little wave to go with the charming smile she always wore. Her free hand ran over her wet breasts, more flirting. I don't want you. I don't like you. Shoo, scram, Darren yelled at her. I'm tired of this crap. Why do you keep following us? Why do you keep tormenting me? Go away. He threw the cup he was drinking from at her. She easily avoided it and waved her finger at him as if she were saying shame to a naughty child. Darren growled and stormed away, done with her, husband or no husband. The boat jerked hard and he lost his footing, slipping to the deck and landing hard on his knee. They had stopped moving completely. Suddenly, Clark was standing before him. What did you do? What the hell did you do? Darren shook his head. Did you what you said to do? I told the mermaid to get lost. I don't like being toyed with. Clark stared angrily at him, his lip curled in a snarl. I said to ignore them, not disrespect them. Now you've pissed them off. You played into her game. Now there's a good chance that we're both going to die, so thank you very much for that. Darren's eyes went wide. I was just trying to get her to leave me alone. I didn't mean... It's too late for that. Clark said, get your gun and be ready to use it. He'll be coming. When the other man ran off to follow that instruction, he pulled a pistol from his belt and held it out before him. He was trying to keep his hand from trembling with the nerves that ran through him like electricity. He stood away from the edges of the boat, but kept his eyes on them. He knew he was coming. It was just a matter of when and from where. He had known they would put their hope in swaying Darren, which would keep them off the ship. He was banking on it. Now they were desperate, drawn to violence. He had seen it before, and it always ended badly. When Darren got back, he was nervously clutching his gun. What do we do now? He said quietly, his eyes dancing from side to side, watching the edges of the boat, waiting for the imminent attack. We wait, Clark told him. Just stay vigilant. The seconds that passed felt like hours. The men kept turning and looking, clutching to the guns in their hands, prepared to use them. 
the attack didn't come. Maybe Clark had been wrong. They were both thinking it, hoping for it. Why did the boat stop? Darren asked in a little more than a whisper. Did you stop it? Maybe we should get moving. Just try to make it home. They hooked us, Darren. The Murr have technology. It's different but effective nonetheless. They fashion things out of stone, bone, and coral, but they're not simple-minded creatures. Their designs are elaborate, their crafting reliable. They basically anchored us, attaching hooks to our hull that are attached to chains carrying weights. It's actually worse than it sounds. If the hooks punctured us, they're also filling up with water. That's probably why the attack hasn't come. They're waiting for us to capsize. I'm going to be honest with you, it's not good. Darren nodded and swallowed the lump rising in his throat. Should I go see? Take a look? Maybe I can dislodge them, get us moving. Maybe we can reach land. Yeah, all right, Clark told him. Go check, assess the damage and get back quickly. We need to cover each other's backs. When Darren ran below, Clark stared into the gentle rocking sea and said, All right, where are you? Come on. We both know you're there. You've been waiting a while. Do you want to do this? Let's do it. His thumb flicked the safety off his gun. A loud bang issued behind him and he spun around. The merman was there. He was enormous. His arms and torso built of rock-solid muscle, and his fishtail was as big as a great white shark. His flesh was tanned and weathered. His hair was as long and red as his mate's, and his eyes hard. His arm was already moving by the time Clark saw him, and his spear launched through the air. Clark's eyes went wide. He tried to move, but he wasn't fast enough. The spear of shell and bone went through his shoulder. He cried out and dropped his gun, slipping to the deck. The merman drew a knife of sharpened bone and snaked towards his unarmed prey. His tail swooshed back and forth, sweeping the deck. The pain in Clark's shoulder was intense. He grimaced and tried to scoot away from the half-fish, half-man that towered over him. Darren came up just in time, saw the merman, and fired his gun. Clark's attacker moved with the bang of the gunshot. The merman flipped over the edge of the boat, disappearing into the water. Did I get him? I think I hit him, but I don't know, Darren said. He ran to the edge of the boat to look and Clark screamed at him to back up. I don't see him, Darren said as he did what he was told. Maybe I got him, or at least scared him off. You won't see him, Clark said, gritting his teeth against the pain. And you certainly didn't scare him off. He's smart, just waiting on his moment. What about the boat? How bad is it? Bad, Darren told him. We need to do something, or we're going to go down. I tried to pry the hooks loose, but they're heavy, solid. They wouldn't budge. The water isn't trickling in, Clark. It's coming strong. Get the cargo. We'll take the rescue boat and try to escape. We're not going to outpaddle the mer, though. We need to kill it before we leave or we're screwed. Here's to hoping the boat lasts long enough for us to do that. Keep your guard up. Next time you need to know for a fact you didn't miss. Darren looked at Clark's shoulder. He wasn't going to be killing anything anytime soon. It was going to be on Darren to do it, and he didn't like it. This wasn't what he signed up for, but what choice did he have? He just hoped when it came down to it, he was able to come through. He felt like he did good when he saw the thing as he came up from below, even if he did miss it. He only hesitated for a moment. It was instinct. He fired before he even realized what he had done. Hurry, go. Just get the cutter go and bring it up here. I can't carry it with this arm. We can't afford to lose it in the flood down there. Go on! Clark yelled at him. The wounded man was stumbling towards the front of the boat as he bellowed his commands. He needed to get through the first aid kit. When he pulled the spear out, he needed to be able to stop the bleeding quickly or he was going to be in big trouble. It was going to be like uncorking a hole in a dam wall. It wasn't going to be easy with one arm, but this wasn't the first time he had been injured on a voyage. He could do it. He knew how to survive out here. While Clark saw his wound and hoped the mermen didn't attack again before Darren's return, the other man was below staring at the cargo hold. He knew that time was of the essence. The boat was quickly filling up with water. The merman could come back, and Clark was badly injured, but curiosity still nagged at him. 
If he was possibly going to die, he wanted to know what for. He wanted to know what was in the box that was worth his life, worth Clark's life, worth the fortune they were being paid for this trip. Darren decided that he had to look to see for himself, and he shot the lock. When it fell away, he opened the lid of the box, and his mouth fell open. He stared wide-eyed at the contents and mumbled a curse under his breath. The mermaids weren't playing games. The attack on the ship wasn't his fault either. Clark was a liar. All of this was on him. He was the one playing games. Darren reached into the box and took out the baby. It was still alive, but it didn't look good, its tail barely moving. I didn't know, Darren said to the pale child, emitting raspy, choking breaths. He carried it up the stairs. Clark was staring at him when he got to the top. His shoulder was spear-free and wrapped tightly with a bandage, the blood seeping through. The spear was in his other hand, a weapon he could still use if he needed to, and by the looks of it, he planned on doing just that. Put it back in the box, he said. Don't think I won't kill you. I won't have to work ever again if I get home with that. They're paying me millions for it, and that money is equally yours. We just have to kill the dad and make it back. We can still do this together. Darren froze. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't draw his gun while he was holding the baby. The baby needed to get back in the water, but Clark was standing in his way with that spear. He needed to buy some time. There was no game, he said. They were following us because you took their child. A child for God's sake. How could you? Put it back in the box. He's dying. He needs water. It doesn't need to be alive for us to get the money, Darren. You can be a millionaire. Be smart about this. Put it back in the box. There was a loud thump behind Clark. He whirled around with the spear raised to face the blood-wielding merman. When he did, Darren kicked him in the back and he stumbled. It was enough. The merman sidestepped the spear and drove the bone blade up under his sternum. Clark gasped. Blood ran from his mouth as well as his wound, and he collapsed to the deck, his eyes staring but not seeing. Darren stepped forward and held the baby out. The man took the child and stared into his eyes. I'm so sorry, Darren said. I didn't know. I swear, I didn't know. A moment passed. Then the merman broke the intense eye contact and nodded. He and his baby dove into the water. The woman was bobbing nearby, waiting for them. She took her baby from her mate and cried out. She sounded like a dolphin, Darren thought. He lowered the small rescue boat and climbed into it. He pushed away from the sinking ship, and the myrrh let him pass. He hoped in his heart that the baby survived. If it should pass, he had a feeling they would come for him, make him pay for their loss, and he couldn't say he would blame them. Whether he knew it or not, he was an accomplice. As he paddled away, he said a silent prayer for the mer baby and for himself. He could feel their eyes on him, boring into his back, watching him go. But he also knew if he turned around to look, he would see nothing. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, The Mermaid's Game, by Kisto Healy. Author of twisted horror tales, as well as innovative science fiction and epic fantasy stories, Kisto is a genre author with an unstoppable imagination who writes seven days a week and tries to write at least one story or chapter every single day. It's his biggest passion. The only thing that means as much as his writing is being a dad to his awesome kids. He also dabbles in art and music and being an interesting person. You can find out more about Kisto Healy by visiting keistohealy.blogspot.com. That's C-H-I-S-T-O-H-E-A-L-Y dot blogspot.com. He can also be reached personally on his Twitter handle at Kisto Healy. You can also find additional Twisted Horror Tales by Keisto on Amazon.com and by searching our archives right here on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights by searching his name.
when the sky is scorched by a falling star that lights up the night and causes great waves to come crashing down on the docks of Portsmouth, someone must be sent to investigate the lingering glow left on the horizon. What force could cause the ocean itself to burn? With so many ships damaged, there are not many left who can find answers. But for the right amount of coin, the crew of the Water Queen are just foolish enough to put out onto the unsettled sea. And now, for your indulgence, The Unsettled Sea by Heath Path. The lantern on my desk flickered and then went out, drenching the cabin in a tar-like darkness. I cursed quietly to myself. It seemed only the day before that I had filled the lamp and I had been ashore since. Carefully, I placed my quill into the rest affixed to my desk and then fastened the lid of my ink. I had cleaned up spills too many times to make that mistake again. The light coming in through the porthole was just enough that I could make out the furnishing of my cabin. I turned and stood to find the flask with my lamp oil. And that's when I first saw him. He was standing in the far corner of the small space, not five feet from me, an unsettling smile on his face. He had a mouth packed with needles that reflected the light of the moon, and I couldn't make out his eyes. They must have been sunken into his face so far that they were invisible in the dark of the room. I startled, stepping back and tripping over the chair I had just departed. I almost fell over, but caught myself by grabbing onto the corner of the desk. My attention was only pulled away for a second, a fraction of a second, but when I looked back up, the man in the corner was gone. He had not moved or attempted to hide elsewhere. He was simply no longer there. Years at sea had given me plenty of opportunity to see all manner of strange phenomenon, and never had I doubted what my eyes told me. Not until that moment. No matter how certain I felt that what I had witnessed was real, it was impossible to see the now empty cabin and not believe that I must have been mistaken. I'd have sworn I had seen a ghost, but there were no men dead or otherwise that looked like the one I had just seen. Perhaps it had been a demon. That was a thought I didn't wish to dwell on. The voyage, I knew, was ill-fated. I had felt it even before boarding the ship, and now that we had been underway for nearly an hour, I was more certain than ever that we had made a grave mistake in taking on this commission. The pay had been high, two months of shipping between the Isle and the mainland to be made up in a few hours, but there was a reason the price was high. There was also a reason that we had been asked and that there had been little competition for the job. When the light in the sky had burned the night so brightly that it was as a second sun falling into the ocean, everyone awake had seen the spectacle. As the light faded over the horizon, a thunderous roar had shaken the earth and shattered glass in the windows of houses. It had been like a physical strike, so deep and powerful that it rumbled your bones and turned your stomach. The waves had come next, great white crested walls of water smashing into the port and destroying ships and buildings alike. A few dozen vessels remained undamaged, with hundreds more broken and in need of major repairs. The Water Queen, my hard-earned brigantine, had been lucky, at least in the sense that she took almost no damage. I retrieved my oil flask and went to fill the lamp, but soon discovered the lamp wasn't empty. The wick had gone out on its own. The glass was down. There was no possibility that it had blown out. Oil lamps didn't blow out easily when they weren't covered, and my storm lantern certainly hadn't just flickered out in the stillness of my cabin. This was another dark portent. Superstition went hand and foot with sailors, and though I tried to keep myself above such things, I could feel the churn of evil in the air. A knock on my door grabbed my attention just as I lit my lamp again. I turned about with a sense of trepidation. Yes? I called, suddenly convinced that the man I'd seen in the shadows was standing on the other side of the door, his needle-filled mouth gaping wide. 
just waiting for me to pull it open so that he could step inside and rend my flesh to strips like a tattered sail. Captain, the lookout has spotted something in the waters ahead. I recognized the voice of my first mate, and the tension building in me flickered out like my candle had not long before. I came to the door and opened it. Mr. Travis, what was there to see? I asked, sliding out of my room with a feeling of relief. A feeling that fled as I turned to draw the door closed and saw that the lantern was out again. Ice ran down my spine, and I had to disguise my hesitation with a small cough before pulling my cabin closed fully. We had a couple different men check the glass, but we're not sure what it is. It looks as though the water is aglow, lights rising up from the brine like ghost lanterns. Something seems to be submerged, but the lookouts say it doesn't look like a ship, and it's not a natural island of any kind. At this juncture, your guess is probably better than ours, he explained as we walked up the stairs onto the deck. The men were quiet now, all looking off the side of the ship facing the lights ahead of us in the ocean. It was an uncanny kind of glow, pale and strong. It didn't flicker like fire, but neither was it the shade of sunlight. It was unlike any light I had seen before. We were cutting our way through the water in the direction of the glow, and it was coming closer quickly. The deck was strangely quiet as everyone watched the unknown draw closer. Come alongside the lights, I called out loudly, getting the crew moving again. I watched as the men, remembering themselves, went back to work, but not without some clear signs of anxiety. I could see the look of fearful superstition in their eyes. Sailors didn't care for the unknown, and I could understand their sentiment. At that moment, I would have preferred to do anything else other than steer my ship towards those damnable lights. Something about this doesn't sit right with me, Captain, Mr. Travis said quietly his deep voice pitched just for my hearing. This whole voyage has been strange. Crew have been reporting all kinds of weird happenings since we left dock, and I myself thought I heard voices rising up out of the water, like men screaming for help out amongst the waves. I've been sailing many years, and nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I'm not the kind to fall for tales of sea beasties waiting to swallow us up, but this whole voyage has a foul reek about it. I nodded once. I am agreed, Mr. Travis, but we are beholden by contract to make the investigation our governor requires. He would not be pleased if we came back and told him we were frightened off by some lights, lights we knew we would find when we left shore. We must at least have a look. The first mate nodded his head as though this was the answer he had expected. When I first saw the star fall across the sky, I felt sick down to the marrow of my bones. He looked over at me, and his eyes held a specter of terror I had never seen there. I thought to myself, Mr. Travis, this is the end of you. The falling star had terrified everyone who had seen it. We had all seen the occasional star streaking across the night sky, but this one had scorched the night as bright as the noon sun, but boiling with fire. It blotted out all the rest of the stars, even the moon, and then it crashed into the ocean. The glow lit the horizon for hours. The waves had come crashing into the shore, even through the natural breakers made by the volcanic mountains that ringed the island. Ships were crushed, and the people unfortunate enough to be in the streets near the docks were washed away, dragged out to sea, and shredded on the volcanic rock, only to be returned with the tide in the form of tattered chum. We've come back from fiercer seas than these, Mr. Travis. We'll come back this time too, and with enough coin to drink ourselves well into the next shipping season. It wasn't easy to muster good cheer, but I did my best to make a show of it. The ship was carrying 65 souls, and I didn't intend to lose a single one of them. As is so often the case, fate cared little for the intentions of men. The lookout was the first to die. I was standing near the ship's wheel, watching as the glow from the sea began to brighten the night, 
turning it into some kind of haunted semblance of what dawn should have been. The light that came from the sea had an unnatural hue to it, a white starkness that was almost cold, and I kept thinking that no light should be coal. Since man had first mastered fire, heat had become the comforting, calming touch associated with light. Not only was the dark chased away, but so was the ice and snow. Why then did this eye-scouring brightness make me shiver in my coat? My first mate had called the light source Ghost Lanterns, and I thought the name was apt. And then the glow was gone, out like someone had thrown a black curtain over the whole thing. A terrible dull thump that was somehow both weighty and wet at the same time was accompanied by the horrified voices of my men. Screams and gasps were not the kind of sounds you like to hear aboard ship, and they got me moving immediately. Without the light of the sea, the ship felt darker than it should. The lantern light seemed to barely cast more than a few feet. Karn has fallen from the lookout, someone cried out. Where is Cordry? Someone else shouted. Someone get the doctor. It's too late for that, someone else said, their voice quieter as I cut my way through my men to the side of their fallen comrade. I needed look only for a second to realize that they were correct. No one could help Karn now. He had landed on his head, and the force of the blow had liquefied his skull before shoving the shrapnel back up into his neck, even as his organs had attempted to compress out through the newly torn opening. Someone gagged and threw up and I turned my head away. Someone bring a tarp and cover the poor boy up, I growled, keeping my voice steady with the force of my will alone. I had seen someone fall from the crow's nest before, but they hadn't landed head first like this. Doing so by accident would be the absolute worst of luck. There were lines and beams along the mast on the way down, and the people I had known that had fallen had at least attempted to slow themselves down, and none had landed head first. Had I not known better, I would have assumed he had dived from the nest intentionally. It was in this moment that the ship struck something. I had never been aboard a ship that had run aground at full speed, and even had I done so, nothing could have prepared me for the force of the impact. Men were thrown to their knees, and Karn's body went sliding across the deck, leaving a trail of gore in his wake. I hit the deck hard enough that my knees were bruised and battered, and I managed to rip my coat. I was struggling back to my feet when my first stumbled towards me, offering me his hand, which I gladly took. I wasn't as young as I once had been, and the wood of the floor had been far less forgiving than I might have liked. What did we hit? I asked trying to get my bearings in the chaos. I don't know, sir. There are no reefs out here, and we are in open water as far as I can see. The first seemed as lost as I felt. I made my way carefully to the railing of the ship, which was the same action most of the men aboard were taking. Everyone was trying to figure out how we had run aground. The light that had been glowing from below the water was gone now, and that left everything eerily dark. Other than the whispered voices of the crew, there was only the sound of water lapping against the hull and the creak of distressed wood as the ship settled on whatever had caught it beneath the water's surface. Jensen, get to below decks and figure out where we've hit. I need to know if there is damage to be worried about. I ordered a man standing nearby. He didn't look pleased to be taken from his place at the railing to go below decks, but I needed information and I needed the crew back in operational shape. Aye, sir, he called, and then he was off to do as ordered. With the light from the sea gone, things were dark out to sea. We couldn't make out anything down at the waterline beyond the fact that there was a waterline. I tried to figure out which way the lights had been from where we currently were. It didn't seem that we should have reached them yet. Someone on the other side of the ship screamed, and all attention turned in that direction. The scream grew louder, and then dwindled before a splash sounded in the ocean on that side. Something dragged Enders over the side! Someone shouted, and then the voices of the crew erupted into chaos. Get the guns! Someone shouted, and suddenly men were surging around me, 
running for the doors down towards the storerooms. Stay yourselves, men, I called out, trying to regain order. Marshal, Avery, you head down to the storeroom and bring up the weapon crates. The rest of you keep your stations. This is still a ship, and on board ship we keep order. You hear me? As I was saying this, my eyes caught movement along the port side rail, just opposite from where I was. I saw what looked like the arm of a man reaching over the railing and grabbing hold of a sail line that was lashed down. The arm was too long, maybe five or six feet, and narrow. Someone else saw it and let out a scream of terror. Demon! A voice shouted, and now chaos really was upon us. The thing coming over the rail used its grip on the line to pull itself up and onto the deck. The impossibly long arm was followed by a second, and then a head that looked like it had torn its way free of a sailor's nightmare. It had the black eyes and mouth of a shark, but the head was long and mobile, like an eel, flopping around as if no bones attached it to the rest of the thing. Those black eyes were on three different sides of its head for a grand total of six of these terrible sensory mechanisms. As it drew itself over the railing and rolled haphazardly onto the deck, men ran over one another to get out of its range. It had a body that was somewhat like a man's, but it was too long, too narrow. It wore no clothing, and its greenish-hued flesh was taut over a ribcage that seemed to take up all of its torso before it shrank into hips that gave way to a set of three legs which were each of a different length. This should have made it difficult for the thing to move, but as soon as it was on the deck, it flopped onto these limbs, using its arms to counter the unbalance of the rest of it, and then it was perambulating with unnatural speed. It tore across the deck after the nearest man as screams lifted into the air. Someone grabbed a boat hook and threw it as the creature streaked past them towards a man who had just turned his back and was attempting to run towards the nearest door down into the ship. The boat hook struck the creature but was quickly knocked away without breaking its monstrous pace. We all watched as the thing sprang from the deck and slammed into the running man with enough force to crush him against the deck of the ship. He let out a wail of horror, but a moment later, the mouth of the terrible thing was ripping into him, tearing strips of flesh from his back and choking them down before moving on to the next bite. Hooks, knives, grab what you can and kill that thing! I shouted, reaching for the saber I had forgotten down in my room. I cursed to myself and grabbed a boat hook from a barrel near the railing. It would have to do. We advanced on it in a group, and it paid us no mind as it continued to eat the man it had slammed onto the deck. He was still screaming. It was the kind of sound that I knew would haunt my memories for as long as I lived. Not wanting my men to think I wasn't ready to put my life on the line, I charged the creature with my makeshift weapon out in front of me. I thought I'd be able to stab the beast before it knew I was coming. It seemed distracted but I was still a good four feet away when its head sprung up, a massive chunk of human arm falling from its still-chewing jaws. Two of its eyes looked right at me and I stopped in place, skidding closer against my desire to do so. One of those hind limbs, the leg things, struck out blindingly fast. It reminded me of the leg of a locust, but only in shape and function, not in physical characteristics. It looked more like a human leg than an insect's, other than the green color. Either way, it stretched far further than I thought possible, and small claws that I hadn't seen slashed at me, cutting my boat hook neatly in half, and then slicing my left arm wide open as easily as a man might gut a fish. It was my turn to scream then. I fell back as the beast rounded, coming in for what I thought was going to be a kill, but it didn't attack me. Instead, it snagged another of the crew, using one of its massive arms to yank him out of place as he attempted to turn and flee. He dropped the knife he had had as it dragged him back across the deck, grabbing him with its other arm as well. There was a terrible cracking, ripping sound, and the creature tore the man in half, splitting him like a dried wishbone. Entrails splattered across the deck. The first man attacked by this new monster was attempting to drag himself away with his one remaining arm. It wasn't going well. There was so much blood. I knew he was dead already. 
There was no way we had stopped the bleeding in time, even if the deck hadn't been in chaos. I struggled to stem my own bleeding as the monster tore into the man it had just spilled open, voraciously consuming his insides. I used my belt to apply pressure to my wound as one of my men came up and helped me to my feet. Everyone was running for the longboats now. Somehow the ship was on fire, the flames leaking across the deck with a hunger matched only by that of the beast devouring my men. A sail took a light, the tarred stays spreading the fire as quick as could be. Fire, the kind of fire that was breaking out on the ship now, it was the death knell of any sea ship. Abandoned ship, I called out, though I hardly needed the words. People were scrambling to get away, but other things had gotten aboard. More creatures similar, and yet different from the first one, were dragging themselves across the wood planking. People were dying everywhere, gruesome slaughter filling the air with a cacophony of wailing agony. There was no sense to any of the creatures. No creator would make beasts of so little order, and nature had not the stomach for this kind of horror. They were an embodiment of chaos, of violent hatred. Had I reached into the heart of humanity and drawn out the black tar of every evil and vile thought we had ever dreamed, I still would not have had the spark necessary to draw these horrors into being. Captain, come on, we have to move. I looked up at the man speaking. I recognized him as one of our skilled craftsmen. He had an arm tucked under mine and a steadying hand on my shoulder. There's nothing here for us to save, he said, drawing me after him. I knew his words were true, but I still couldn't fathom how this had all happened so quickly. How long had it been since I was writing in my journal in my room? Five minutes? Ten? Somewhere between the two, I thought. And yet in those fleeting minutes, everything had changed. Abandoned ship! I called again, one last time, and then I let myself be drawn to an escape craft. The boat hit the water hard, and then the men were at oars, trying to get us clear of the burning ship. I pulled out my compass and pointed the direction back to Portsmouth. Due east! I pointed the way. Keep a hard pace! I just wanted to get everyone left away from the burning ship in this whole chaotic mess. The ship was the primary light source now. It was a flaming pillar of screams and nightmares. I wasn't sure whether the men were luckier to burn or encounter the monsters that lurked the decks amidst the flames. The men paddled hard and it seemed we were moving away from the ship at a good pace, but then the light from the sea came aglow and it was all around us. The intensity of it was blinding. It was as though the very water itself had been reborn as a star. But as I looked over the edge of the lifeboat, I could see that this wasn't the case. There was something in the water, some massive structure that bubbled and burned even beneath the sea. It looked to be made of metal, but I had never seen anything so big made entirely of metal before. It would have fit my ship inside with no difficulty many times over. There was writing up on its outside, but not in a language I recognized. Is it a sunken ship? One of the other men in the raft asked. Not one of ours, that's for sure. I looked over and saw that Mr. Travis was standing at the opposite side of the boat. He was looking out over the side before he turned back over his shoulder and looked at me. The light reflected in his eyes, making them look like two black marbles, though it was just a matter of the shadows being cast by the bright light below us. It had to be. Look, Captain. He turned and pointed. There's a place to land over there. Where he pointed, there was a pulsing light of dark red, and there did appear to be something at the surface there. It made me feel uneasy, though. No, I spoke firmly. We should follow the compass east. Sir? One of the men near me asked, looking up at me. Are we still going east? I looked down at my compass again. The needle was slowly shifting, as though it was floating without a firm cause. I turned it, and the needle swam about in a circle, not settling on any given point. Why was it doing that? 
We should land and get our bearings. My first called across the boat. The compass isn't working. I don't want to get lost at sea. That red light hung ominously to our port side, and we seemed to be drawing closer despite battling the other way. Seas be damned, I cursed quietly. Make for the red lights. We'll draw up there and gather ourselves, I said, deciding that Mr. Travis was right. We didn't want to paddle deeper out to sea. That was a death sentence as much as anything else. Sir, are you sure? One of the others in the boat asked. Everyone was looking at me as though my idea was insane, and for some reason that made me angry. Why were they questioning me? Travis had made it clear that this was a good idea, and with his opinion and mine for consideration, they should know better than to ask questions. Yes, I'm sure. Paddle hard. Let's get our feet on firm ground. I made the command firmer this time. My head was feeling a bit light, likely due to blood loss. The others looked back and forth amongst one another, but then they started to turn the boat and we were moving. There were so many screams in the air, rising up all around me. Did they come from the water, or were they from the boat I was in? It was impossible to tell. I tucked myself further into my coat. It wasn't long before we were drawing up upon the red lights, and the boat came aground, though not upon an island. We struck metal. The firm stopped knocking me down into the boat before someone helped me up again. I looked at this new madness with a critical eye. We were on a hill of metal, the surface smooth and slick looking. There was a hole near the top of the hill, a hole or hatchway with a heavy door attached to it that was open. I disembarked, having the others join me. Bring the boat up and fasten it to that door, I ordered, not wanting to lose our ride. I turned around looking for Mr. Travis. I found our skilled craftsman first. I thought his name was Ogdry. What is this thing? He asked quietly as he came up beside me. I don't think we should be here. We need a minute, Ogdry. We have to figure out which direction will lead us back to the island. If we get lost out here in the longboat, then we're done. No one will ever find us. I told him, moving towards the door. The ground looked slick, but the metal, or whatever the material was, had a textured surface that seemed to hold my boots firm. I made it to the hatchway quickly enough. When I looked down inside the hatch, I found myself staring down a tunnel that dropped at least a hundred feet, but it didn't look like any tunnel I'd seen before. This had clearly been built by something intelligent. It wasn't really a tunnel at all, but a hallway that was up on its end. There were doors off to the sides, and more of those ghost lights flickered along the hallway, lighting the whole stretch downward. It looked like there were even more tunnels branching off at the end of this, each meticulously identical crafted with flawless precision and out of materials I couldn't identify. Mr. Travis, are you seeing this? I asked, expecting the man to have followed after me. Sir? Ogdry asked. Yes, I replied, looking away from the tunnel and back to Ogdry. I'm Len Ogdry, sir, he replied, and I could see an anxiety upon the man. I know who you are. I snapped, my patience a bit more frayed than I'd expected. Where is the first? Mr. Travis is... He cleared his throat. One of those things got him up on the ship, sir. He didn't make it to the boat. No, that's... I just talked to him. I pushed past Ogdry towards the other men, but there was no one there. It wasn't just Travis that was missing. It was everyone... Worse, the boat was gone as well. Where's the cutter? I asked, though I wasn't sure who I was asking. I turned back around to face Ogdry to ask him the same question, but Ogdry wasn't there. Instead, there was a man in black finery, with eyes as dark as the abyss of space, the blackest point between the furthest stars. His smile was too big, mouth full of too many teeth, that were all as sharp as broken glass. 
You, I said, my voice dry. He nodded, keeping his eyes on me, that smile never fading. What are you? What is happening? Desperation crept into my voice. I was confused and afraid, and I had never felt either of those emotions with the stinging clarity that I did in that moment. I am many things, Captain, but you will know me as the Herald of the Darkness. I am the voice that comes before the answer to the question your people shouldn't have asked. He spoke in words that prickled at my mind, as though I heard them through the bleeding of my brain and not through any sound they made. He stepped towards me, and I tried to retreat, but found my body wouldn't move. He held up a small black sack with drawstrings. It seemed to radiate cold. Take it, he urged, and I couldn't resist. I reached up and took the pouch from him, meaning to open it and look at what he had given me, but he clicked his tongue. No, 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 you mustn't look inside. Some things weren't meant for mortal minds to see. You will deliver this thing for me, and you will take a message to your people. I can't. My voice was fragile to my own ears. I just can't. In the presence of this horror, I felt as though I might die in place, that my heart might explode in my chest, and that would be preferable to continuing this conversation. Yet you will. It has already come to pass. He smiled again, the teeth in his mouth grinding together as he did so, making a sound like metal scraping over smooth stone. Then there was darkness, and forevermore, there would always be darkness. I hope you enjoyed The Unsettled Sea, as written by Heath Paff and performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. To find more from Heath Paff, please visit simplyscarypodcast.com backslash path, spelled P-F-A-F-F, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com where you'll find ways to follow him on his website of foxesmind.com. That's O-F-F-O-X-S-M-I-N-D.com, as well as a link to his work on Amazon.com by clicking his Amazon link on that profile. A small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we are proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S.net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at 
Fear from the Heartland. Chilling tales for dark nights.